My name's Kent Montgomery. I'm uh, an instructor here at Central Lakes College in Brainerd, Minnesota. Um, recently, most recently, I've, I've my career has been kind of all over the place. Um, forestry, wildlife, fisheries. I've done a little bit of everything um, kind of across the U.S., out of the country, uh, including a couple stints, field seasons down in Antarctica um, early in my career. Um, most recently, I worked for the Nature Conservancy for about five years, including some fire work. We did a lot of uh, uh, urban interface uh, fire preparation. Um, uh, worked for the University of Minnesota Extension for a number of years, um, and then uh, wound up at uh, at Central Lakes College. Um, my master's program actually involved. Uh, it was the Forest Bird Diversity Initiative, a few of you might know about, uh, where we had a, a long-term uh, bird monitoring program to look at the response of neotropical birds, their breeding in terms of um, uh, different forest management practices out there. So um, I've kind of been in forestry, forest ecology probably more accurately um, through a lot of my career doing lots of different aspects of that. Um, Currently, um, like I said, I, we live in Brainerd. We're back on some family property. Our kids are fifth generation here. We have a 300-acre site. We, uh, as Mark mentioned, um, maple syrup um, hauled in 220 gallons yesterday and back out to the woods today, um, boiling it down last night. So uh, that keeps me busy. We also do um, some selection logging out here, individual or group selection primarily. Um, I have a sawmill, um, so we try and keep all the value added right here in, in our place and convert it from tree to lumber to product right here on site. So kind of setting myself up for my retirement here to keep me busy and out of trouble. But um, what, what you wanted to hear about was kind of what we're doing at Central Lakes College. So um, a little bit of background, and I'll, I'll jump into, I've got a few slides to help illustrate um, kind of where we've been and, and where we hope to go. Um, so this semester, this spring semester, which for us starts in about mid-January and runs to early May, um, I'm on sabbatical. Um, and one of the things that I'm doing is to try and um, kind of reinvigorate our program or redefine it, re re-identify it. <clears throat> like everything else that that you know, it's it's tough to find workers. Um, students have um, a different set of expectations, a different set of values than, than when we went through. Um, and I did the math a while ago. Um, and even though I think I'm, I'm kind of young, um, when I did the math, if I would have been in college, uh, an instructor my age would have been born in the 30s. So that, that gave me a good frame of reference as to, yeah, I am old and I'm ancient to many of these, these folks here. Um, but we're trying to we're trying to refigure how we go about um, meeting their needs and still meet the needs of natural resources out there. Um, so our Central Lakes College program, a little bit about it. We're a two year program. Um, we are a kind of an integrated natural resource program. So I always tell students this is like when you're a kid and you have to eat a little bit of everything on the plate to see if you like it. So you get a little bit of forestry, you get a little bit of fisheries, you get a little bit of wildlife, you get a little bit of parks and rec. Um, and I also tell them we're an upside down program. Most four year programs, um, you don't get into these sorts of classes until you know your junior, junior senior year. Um, whereas these students with a two year program, they kind of hit the ground running. Um, and they get these right off the bat. And then when they go on, if they choose to go on and complete a four-year degree, a lot of times then they'll have a lot of the other courses that they did not get, maybe things like sociology, um, uh, government, um, different things like that that might be included in the liberal arts component as well as um, some of the more detailed classes. <clears throat> this, is, um, this is a typical class that we have. Um, the, I, I counted this just before we got on and this hits right within our demographic. We're usually about 40% women and 60% men. Um, if you're not familiar with, with 
community and technical colleges. The other thing is this is kind of a little unusual picture because we're really diverse on our student makeup. Um, we do get a lot of students right out of high school that you can see here, but a lot of times we get students coming back and I've got a couple in here that have been uh, um, back on the GI Bill. <clears throat> when Afghanistan and, and Iraq war were happening, we were running 15, 20% of our students um, were, were um, veterans. Um, we also see older students. I've had students my age in classes who are coming back to um, pick up um, some natural resources for whatever. So it's the, the students you would typically think of, plus we have probably about 20%, 30% who make up this. Um, we think of them maybe as non-traditional, but a, a different demographic. This is kind of a, a trend that we saw and got us on this path. Um, so on here, I've got a couple different lines we're tracking across the years and number of students. The blue line is kind of a metric we use that students we have after the first week of classes. And so the numbers show how many students we've had in one of my classes I used to track this. So they're not huge numbers. Um, they, they kind of fall out around <clears throat> 24 to 18 typically. Um, and that's been pretty steady through the years. And we use the first week because the students have one week to decide if they want to drop the classes with no, they, they get a full refund. And so after that, we figure they're, they're in. Um, the red line is what we have at the end of the semester. And you can see when we, if you go to those first few years, um, you know, we track pretty close, we lose a few. Um, and I should add too, um, we're, we're kind of a unique system is that when we get things like recessions and the economy goes sour, we get a lot of students back in for training. And I've had, I've had lecture classes of 50 some students when um, we had really um, bad economic downturns like 2009, 2010, 2011. Um, but this is, this is typical. And if you draw your attention to especially 2016 here, this is what prompted us. We started with 14 students, and at the end of the semester, we had six. Okay, we're a two-year program, so now we've got six students for the next three semesters. And, you know, besides losing students and, and, and not getting them into the careers and everything else, business-wise, that's, that's not a good model for our college. So we asked if we could take a look at this and try something different. And we did that. And you can see that beginning in 2018, we made this shift. Um, 19 and 20, we were not able, we were not only able to kind of bring them back up, but probably higher numbers, losing one student a semester than what we had before. Uh, then again, we had the pandemic hit um, and uh, our numbers dropped and and we've been kind of recovering from that, um, but still probably better than we would have been otherwise. So here's what we did back in 2018, and it's kind of the, the model of what we're hoping to do um, going into this. So <clears throat> this was our first semester, first year students. These are the students coming right in from high school. They're coming in from um, maybe other careers and, and getting some different training. And what we did was to take three of our classes and block them together. Um, students sometimes have difficulty seeing the connection between classes right? because we, we separate them. Many times we have different instructors. Um, for us, there are two full-time instructors at Central Lakes and Natural Resources, so it's a little easier to integrate things. Um, but even so, when we, we parse them out um, by different disciplines, it's tough to make those connections. So we rolled together plant taxonomy and dendrology, which fit together real well. And we incorporated our introduction to GIS GPS class. Um, what we did was to make sure that all the learning objectives that we had in each one of these courses were still there when we put these three courses together. Um, they might be in different orders at different times, but they were still there. With these classes, instead of a, a Tuesday, Thursday, maybe eight to nine, and then a Thursday lab, these were all lumped together. And so I had the students for eight hours. 
and we have uh, we have 24 passenger buses. I have a CDL, so I can take them out and and drive them around. So every day we would load the bus at 8:30 and disappear, and we were gone from the college for you know six six eight hours doing different things. Um, what we did with this was we were very um, focused on the Minnesota DNR native plant community um, typing. So in their first four weeks, um, the students uh, would drag out a grid, um, identify vegetation and trees and type out the native plant communities. Um, we would then use uh, our GPS that they've learned how to use, um, get those positions learn the difference between how do you determine a, a, a MSC 36 from MSC 35, what plants are diagnostic, and, and learn to find the boundaries and map those boundaries. So you know, within a few weeks, they'd mapped and created polygons of different plant communities. We had a, a long list of years of, of herp um, reptile, amphibian observations. We put those together. Then within four weeks, the students were giving presentations on species habitat relationships, analyzing those, looking at them. Um, and it, it stretched them. And I told them it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be confused. You just want to get you through this. This is, we're, as professionals, we're usually wrong and confused a lot of the time too. No, no reason you shouldn't be as well. Um, but we did this, we, we incorporated these classes, they got all the elements of plant tax and, and dendrology as well as the GIS GPS. And it was in a very applied integrated setting. And that seemed to really address that issue that we had with student drop off. They wanted to be outdoors. They didn't want to be sitting in a, a lab, looking at a screen and listening to me. They wanted to be outside. And this is where we did the learning. We accelerated the learning. We, we took it at about <clears throat> two times normal speed. So everything that they would cover in 16 weeks, we usually had about, excuse me, nine or 10 weeks into it. We did also what's called a, I was hesitant at first. Um, and after we had to go to the pandemic and Zoom, it, it seemed that this is going to work out okay. We went to this flipped classroom model. And the flipped classroom is where the students have recorded lectures that they watch outside of class. And so when you get to class, you can focus on a little higher level integration than you would otherwise. They've got the, the basics, hopefully, out of the way. The thing I learned about it is they can pause a Zoom. They can catch up on the notes. They can, they can take a moment if they have to and come back at it. They can watch it a second time. They can come back three weeks later before an exam and review it again. It, it was much, much better. And we did this um, in part to get them through this, um, get these concepts right away. And then we would go out in what's called durable learning. We do the same thing over and over in different environments. So they apply plant tax, dendro, GIS. It might be different projects as you'll see in a minute, but they, they included all three elements and they used them again and again and again. So those, those learning to download, um, uh, GIS points or GPS points or to build shape files or um, they were building uh, attribute tables and everything their first semester. They were doing that again and again, putting the data they collected with the, the GI, uh, GPS locations and building shape files. And they did that repeatedly. And even though they might have stumbled or had some troubles at first, by the time they did it three, four times, they were starting to get pretty good at it, that mastery that we're after. And then at the end, since we had finished up about 10 weeks into it, um, many of these students have never been through the, uh, <clears throat> the, the gauntlet of a final exam, where one week it's high stakes, all or nothing, one after another after another, and it just beats them down, especially most students don't realize how much study it requires to be ready for that. So these three classes had three different attempts at a final exam. Plant tax and dendro were largely identification. That's what they need. They, they got the background on plant physiology and some other things, systematics, taxonomy um, from the lectures. And they had lecture exams on that, but we really focused on the ID because that's what they're going to need. 
the introduction to GIS GPS was was doing a project from beginning to end, including collecting information, building um, shape files, attribute tables, and into coherent and and usable maps. Um, and they had three attempts. If they didn't do well the first one, they could come back and try it again. Hopefully, learn from their problems what they didn't know and do it again. My my caveat was always, hey, if you're sandbagging me on the first one and I'll do well in the second or third, I might just give you that score and you're stuck with it, like it or not. Um, and the students looking at those across the board, um, with with a couple exceptions, there were there were marked increases in grades, sometimes almost two letters going from maybe a C to an A or a D to a B. So this was something that helped them understand. It wasn't, we get caught up in evaluations and assigning grades, but this is nothing more than to real, you know, to measure whether students are able to understand and do this stuff. And the evaluation, if used right, like I think in this case, can itself be a tool to learn. Um, so it was a good piece for them to realize what they didn't did know, and more importantly, what they didn't know. A lot of times there's a lot of um, self-confidence that isn't really accurate. They think they can do more or know more than they do, and this is really a good equalizer. And so they get that, and then they can go back and study some more and hopefully improve in that. So this is what we think resulted this approach in going from you know, losing 40% of our students to, to losing only one during the semester. So the idea was, why don't we do this with all of our semesters? Why don't we do this across the board, all, all four semesters, all two years? Um, oh, I, I should mention, here's, here's um, some of these, these projects. So the first four weeks, five weeks, we're working on the species habitat relation. And then we went over and worked with many different agency partners and did um, projects that hopefully were things that they needed to get done, that they didn't have the staffing, and were within the skill sets of our, our students at that time. Um, so on the far right-hand side, this is a very interesting one we did out at uh, Mille Lacs Cathio State Park. It's the fifth largest state park here in Minnesota. Um, talking to the park manager, they were really, if, if you've been to Mille Lacs Cathio, it's a, it's a mesic hardwood system. It's largely a, um, a maple uh, basswood uh, climax forest out there. And the park manager had seen all these reports of white pines. Um, and we've all heard the stories of white pines in Minnesota. And he wanted some accurate way to de um, describe that to the visitors. So year after year after year, we've been going out and knocking off a chunk of this. And the students go out, we break them into groups, they search. Um, we've been using Avenza maps, so they know they can track where they are and they can build those maps as well. And they record with their G, uh, GPS every white pine or pine stump they can find out there. They persist in our environment for 80 years or more with the resins in them, um, the hardwoods quickly fall away. We go through the difference of identifying hardwood versus um, pine stumps out there. And they've recorded these. And these have given us kind of a, a picture of where these trees were maybe 100 years ago or something. And so it's a look back in time that we're working through. We're, we're doing a little analysis of, of LIDAR data to look at elevation, look at aspect, um, look at wetlands out there to try and see if there's any patterns we can we can pull away as well as to build some interpretive materials. So this is a great example of, of them using the skills that they've, they've learned um, in a way that benefits some of the agency staff. It's real important stuff that they're doing. And we, we let them know that, that this isn't just a, a, ex, a lab exercise. What you're doing is going to add to an agency's ability to deliver what it's been charged to deliver. Um, other things on here, we've been doing some nested plot surveys for um, uh, prairie regenerations. We've been doing some work with Fisher uh, here in central Minnesota, putting up nesting um, structures to determine if that's a limiting element for their recovery. Um, the lower left, I heard a couple, uh, couple of you working with biochar. We did a, um, a project um, along um, a 
the uh, Pearl Wing River here, uh, where we were removing buckthorn and actually producing biochar, working with uh, um, uh, Minnesota greening, great, uh, great river greening, excuse me. Um, and I also worked with them on a, a savanna, jack pine savanna restoration. And we did uh, some work in, uh, here as well as uh, replanting shrubs in a wildlife management, uh, rough grouse management area. So these are a few. They've done work. These are terrestrial. We've also done work with assessing um, sediment loads on, on trout streams and some other things. All the different things that um, they're not that complicated, but they're, they're important data. So these projects begin about week five. Um, they go on not only through week 10, but when they're taking the um, uh, their exams. So these will continue into about the middle of November. Um, we like the, the, the white pine stump mapping because we can do that during deer season. It's closed in there. There's no rifle hunting. It's a safe environment for them to work at. Um, and again, so how can we do this for the rest of the semester? Well, what we're looking at are, are these elements we would like, we're, we're exploring or I'm exploring to, to try and put together. One of those is longitudinal work. So we want to go back to the same location um, and build upon learning and their work at that research site. So for instance, if they're out doing native plant community typing and herbs, this is a great place to go back and um, trap and um, look at small mammal use. Um, because now they can correlate, are we seeing the same patterns with herps using the habitat as small mammals? Or it might be now that they are working in limnology and they're assessing um, the watershed for subwatersheds and understanding what drains into what pore points in the, in the lake, they can get an idea how these affect the water quality. Um, and as well as when we bring forest management into it, now they can look at all these different pieces um, much more systematically. We're trying to build this, so our ecosystems management course, which is offered their last semester as kind of a capstone. So again, it'll be in the same location. They've done all these, these different things. And I should, I should mention too, our first year courses really are, are built on um, identification, systematics, <clears throat> how do species work, different biologies, for instance, of fish versus, and physiologies of fish versus small mammals, ruminants, all those sorts of things. The second year, we start to look at integrating those things and managing them. So the ecosystems management kind of sits on top of that. And as they're working through fisheries management, forest management, and wildlife management, these should bubble up to ecosystems where now they can take each of those classes that they're working and integrate them together into an overall integrated management plan. Um, we're also looking at um, when we get them out um, in their first year and they're learning um, identification and systematics and how things work is the first semester is to really have a terrestrial focus. And the second semester is an aquatic focus in the same area with that same idea of longitudinal. We're going to be in the same spot. So they start to see the integration between terrestrial and aquatic that you, there's not a hard boundary between there. These things are, are integrated and they work together. Some ways we see, some ways are not so easy to see. <clears throat> what we also want to do, and Mark and I talked about this a little bit, is we're starting to do some work with um, forest legacy elements. Um, so these are the pieces that you will see in ecologic um, forestry. Um, so we're looking at those, those things such as large um, live trees, 24 inches or greater that are retained, large dead trees, many times the live trees becoming dead trees, and large down logs, again, following that pathway. And, and some of those uh, maintenance of these things in, um, in forest management practices, so that legacy persists across different rotations. It's out there, we've seen it, <clears throat> but what we're trying to do is to document the use. <clears throat> Excuse me, we've got um, game cameras right now on some of these uh, legacy elements in Camp Ripley. We work closely with our partners at Camp Ripley, which is a 54,000 acre military reserve, very close to us. We run the kids down there. Um, we go through the training so they can go downrange and do all that. <laughs> 
We have found a couple unexplored ordinances, which is always interesting, um, but they know what to do and how, how to deal with that. But this is an area that we're, we're concentrating a lot of our research. It's a great opportunity for us down here. And we've got these on to take a look at the use of these either in uh, uh, undisturbed or a managed habitat. And, and how do they differ? Um, are they worth keeping? And maybe even get at what's the monetary value of keeping something like this? Here's what you're losing maybe in revenue, but here's what you're gaining in, in other um, there, it's tough to put a dollar sign on that, but we'll, we'll do our best, but we're just trying to get some understanding. So people understand, you know, what is the value of retaining a large down log and things like that. We'll be, um, doing some work. Uh, a friend of mine did some graduate work with small mammals where they're, they're, um, we, we had a powder fluorescent powders that would go on them. You kind of put them in a little Ziploc bag and do a shake and bake and they come out bright orange or bright pink and you let them go. And then you go back at night with a black light and you can see absolutely everywhere where that mat, that little guy went. Um, and you really get an idea of how they're using large logs and those areas underneath for runways and things like that. And you see these elements the way many of these, these animals see them. Um, and the other thing I should add with, with these programs that we're trying to do is a strong native plant community classification throughout. So we keep coming back to that. And also when the students are here the first semester, <clears throat> part of their lab fees in, <clears throat> in GIS GPS purchases their own GPS receiver. It's, a, it, it's not commercial level, but it's a high-end consumer grade. And we want them to use that in every single class to keep that fresh, to learn new different, new and different ways to use that. And we think these are two things that are really important for them to come away with and to be competitive and useful to, to employers. One of the things that that is become um, that, that we're working for has become a, a, a opportunity through this sabbatical research is a one-year forestry certificate. We've been talking with the DNR. We've, um, there, there's a little bit, uh, we have, I should mention, we have program development committees, which are kind of unusual. So every year we bring together our program development committee, which includes lots of different agencies, Forest Service, um, <clears throat> Park Service, the Minnesota DNR, NRCS, SWCDs, a lot of different folks from a lot of different aspects, disciplines, to help guide our program. Are we training the people that you need to get? What are the new trends that we need to be aware of? <clears throat> what are the things that we're missing? And how do we do better? And this is kind of, a couple of years ago, we got the feedback from the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and we built a two-year, in our two-year program, we have a, a, a certificate, just three semesters we add on where the students go out and it's based each one, one um, I'm sorry, three credits. Each one credit class focuses on an area that NRCS deals with. So there's a farmstead, there's a pasture and cropland, and then there's a forestry that are how their conservation programs are organized. The students go out, they see those, they work with the, the private landowners, understand farm equipment, um, and some of those things. And once they're done, they can be hired with a two-year degree, a direct hire into NRCSs. And with the Inflation Reduction Act that we saw a year ago, in Minnesota alone, that, that resulted in 50 new positions in the NRCS, not just positions that need to be filled due to attrition, but new positions in addition to those. So this has been a great um, partnership, and we're pushing a lot of our students into these into these positions. And we're looking at trying to do the same thing with forestry. And one of the things that comes up is a lot of times we have students who have degrees or just want to get out and do things. And we've been working with the Minnesota DNR. In fact, they're kind of reviewing this right now with a group to make sure that we're, we're hitting some of the things that they want. So as you know, oftentimes um, the SAF accreditation is what drives the programs. Well, even with our two-year program, we can't be SAF 
certified unless we just go all in on forestry. But we have fisheries, we have wildlife, we have everything, and we feel it's important to have that 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 multidiscipline approach because that's the world we all work in. <clears throat> there are programs that that focus on forestry and our SAF and can do that. We cannot. But we're trying to figure out, is there a way we can get what they need with the one year, with the, the, the definite understanding that is, hey, if you want to go on and work your way up or do other things in, in DNR forestry or forest service or anything else, you're going to need more schooling. But this will get you in the door. Once you're in there, you're, you're kind of getting a wage. Maybe the employers will help with time off or maybe even some cost assistance with, with um with your schooling, but this will get you in. It's not the be all end all, but it'll get you started. And so we've taken a look at our, our courses and tried to distill them down to what's most important for that, that person who's going to be going out marking timber sales and doing things. And based on what we have, these are the courses that have come up. I've broken them down by the fall semester, the spring semester. Um, there's a total of, um, I've got it blocked off here. I think I've got a total of 33 credits. I think it's 16 and 17. I can't quite see it with the, with the, um, uh, window here, but you get an idea of what we're, we're looking at here. Those that are in, uh, italics are our second year courses. So those would be typically, um, courses that students take their second year and we're cramming them into the first. Um, so we've got, for the most part, we figured out how to integrate our first year and second year schedules to do this. Um, there's a couple things that that we're we're trying to get feedback. So business math. Um, anyone who's familiar with forestry knows that there's usually a, a macro and a microeconomic requirement. Does a person going out and doing timber sales need that level? The business math is. Um, it isn't just basic adding, um, dividing it. There's there's applications for running a business, which is helpful. Um, looking at um, building spreadsheets, looking at um, cost projections and things like that, that, that might be helpful there. Maybe that isn't necessary. That's our first attempt at it. Maybe composition one isn't the best thing. Maybe we can substitute four credits for something else. <clears throat> Those are out there. Those are what we're getting feedback for. Many of the courses we teach, like plant tax, dendro, um, but those are things that are kind of hardwired into us. It's tough to add additional classes or, or do that. The beauty of this is we don't have to bring in 20 students to make it work. These students would sit right on top of our other programs. So it's the, the college is going to have no problem offering these. If we create a brand new program, they'll say, well, we need at least 12 students to make it work for you, and we may not be able to get that. And, and so this is a model that will make this sustainable for us, but we also want it to make, make it so the graduates are useful um, to the employers and we're, we're selling them what they need. We don't want to train them in something that puts them out there and, and it doesn't meet their needs. We, we have, a, uh, I believe we have a, a obligation to the students with the money they're spending, the time they're in there to make sure they're getting everything they need. The other thing we have here is another course. Ironically, I just said we weren't going to add any, but we have one down here, this forestry field school. So as I said, our our, our fall semester starts uh, sometimes the first, maybe, I'm sorry, the, the fourth or the third week in August. So we have an early start, much earlier than than many of the four years. Um, but we have an early out. They're out um, usually the second week of May is their their finals week. And so what we're looking at is taking a week after that, and most of our internships that our students take part in in the summer don't start till later May. And this would be a perfect time to do this, this field school. And what we're talking about with this, and again, this is all conjecture and planning and draft at this point. But this would be additional skills in a one-week intensive course. Um, again, we would probably look at Camp Ripley. We might look at some other places, maybe going up to Deep Portage Conservation or Environmental Center up in Cass County um, that has um, thousands of acres around it. Um, this area where we can go out and work with active forest management. 
um, and to do additional things. We we will take and do some of the things we're doing um, in our civic culture and forest management class, but we want to do it um, more focused and, and more intensely to make sure that they're ready to go and and do the jobs that they would be we we'd be doing. So some of the uh, data collection tools we want to get them out and using things like Terraflex or Arc Collector or some of these smartphone applications. Um, uh, maybe working with data loggers. Um, again, this is the feedback we need from the agencies. We want to train them on the technology and the equipment that they use. There's no use going out. Uh, well, I'll be honest. I train them. I make them do cumulative tally sheets on paper and calculate all that. I think it's really important that this isn't just a black box. They pump, punch numbers in and, and the, the, the result comes out because many times they don't know if that's good or bad. They have no way of assessing that. So they, I make them do everything by hand before they get to do these things. Um, we want them to work more with data management and especially with some of the remotely sensed data, possibly including drone data out there. Um, the economic and business considerations, that's something that we don't spend a lot of time on. And if there's elements that we need to get them up to speed, this is the time to do it. Um, we also... I think as much time as we can we can get them experience with grading and valuation is helpful. Um, one of the the most important things, my learnings was a a one one day class I I did when I was in extension, and we went out and we looked at some hardwoods, we graded them, but then we went into cutting those trees, harvesting them. Um, they went through different felling techniques, but more importantly was taking that tree after we graded it and putting it right on a mill and cutting it out into products so we could see what it looked like standing up. We could see frost cracks or things like that. We could see what they look like as lumber. And I think that might be, might be a good piece. Again, maybe not. Maybe the other things are more important. And the, the last one is we would love to get them certified for private forest plan writing. Um, I don't know if we can do that or not, but it's been pointed out to us that many of the plan writers here are, many of them are, are retired DNR folks. We were out with one gentleman um, pushing his, pushing into his 80s, um, one, of, one of our NRCS forestry um, visits, and he was out there with the landowner talking about how they set up the forest um, planning. And with the S, uh, S excuse me, SFIA and the 2C and conservation easements and everything that requires uh, a, a written forest plan and the turnaround on that, plus people who just want them. There's certainly, um, there's, there, there's a need for people doing, doing that. And if our, our students can, can do that, we, we're going to tell them that most likely this isn't going to be a career that you do unless you're really focused and, and can really go into this. This might be something that is required um, with your, your work or maybe something you do on the side or whatever, um, but to try and incorporate that as well. But, but yeah, thank you, Kent. I, I know I got a few things before I jump into my stuff. What, what, is, what questions, uh, feedback, comments from the team? Go ahead. I, I was just wondering, Kent, how, you know, recently the governor ratcheted down requirements for a lot of state jobs as far as educational requirements. I've never heard, does that fit in the forestry? Is that going to play into what we're, you're doing, you think? It, it's been in discussion. I think, quite honestly, some of the agencies are still trying to figure out exactly what that means for them from, from what I discern from that. And, and I think that's part of the discussion of this advisory team that's kind of looking at our one-year certificate. Um, they're getting hit with, with our one year about the same time as they're trying to interpret what the governor's intention is on this. So they're sorting out everything right now, but yeah, that would certainly, you know, we would be poised to hopefully, you know, get graduates who have a re hopefully a good skill set in a relatively short time and cost effective for the students um, to get them out there and, and, and meet this need. 
Um, I think one of the points some of you may not be familiar with, I'm sure it's the same in other areas, but um, one of the uh, DNR foresters I was talking to, I think they had, um, it was either nine openings and eight, eight candidates or uh, uh, eight openings and nine candidates. So it's been really tough to, to attract um, some people in, especially um, positions in very remote areas, because those come up again and again and again. Tower, places like that, you guys are, might be familiar with. Um, although the, the student might love it, um, when it comes time for marriage or a family, the spouse a lot of times says, get me out of here. And many times they might be looking. It's a way in and they transition to a different office and then that place is, is back back to where they were. And in fact, sometimes they don't even really get to know um, those workers there. They they come and go so frequently. Thanks for that. That's great stuff. Uh, frankly, it uh, gives me hope. Um, and so thank you for what you do there. Um, I have a question. Perhaps I missed it. I mean, I know you mentioned cumulative tally sheets, but um, I didn't see much. Again, perhaps I missed it on, you know, the inventory, mensuration, sampling, uh, is that covered? Uh, certainly going to be part of any kind of forest plan writing, right? So I, I assume it's in there. I just didn't see it. Yeah, yeah. And we hit a lot of that. That would be part of the data collection, data management. And we do hit that really hard in the civiculture forest management class. Okay. So we go through um, cruising. We go through um, whether it's a variable or fixed radius. Um, so they, they have a, a sense how to do those when they're most applicable, how to handle the data, how to interpret history school. Here's another time to do it again. Make sure they're, you know, the more times you do something, the better you get. And there's always something you seem to learn. So yeah, we would we would definitely have have that in there. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you. And, and if I could, just a, another, just kind of curious your take over time um, about you know, what are these students, where are they coming from? What do they want? What do they respond most to? What don't they like? What do we need to change? Any kind of insights you have with working with this next generation this way? Curious to hear. Well, it, it, it's kind of, and, and there's a couple of you on the call here, I'm sure, nodding, but you, you can probably, those, those of you interns have probably there's been an indelible mark left on you by the pandemic, whether you were in college, whether you're in high school, going to online learning um, and how it's kind of affected you in education or coming back to education, especially in person um, and, and just other things. Um, I can tell you it was, it was last semester. I think I had two students that did not have a mental health crisis, did not. Um, out of not just the stu the twenty some, but all my students, we're we're kind of coming out of that, and that's something that it doesn't take a year to go away, and it probably won't take ten years to go away. That's something that's that's going to be there with these students, and it's going to color how they view everything. Um, aside from that, um, it the the students are are uh, um, from what many of us are familiar with. Um, everything is on uh, a smartphone. Um, you know, even websites that we think about are 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 not used as much. It, it's and so as much as we can make things smartphone available, and and it's cost effective for us if we don't have to buy data loggers. They all have smartphones. Build things into that. Um, that would be helpful. Um, as as far as what are their motivations. Um, one thing that we see, or at least one of my perceptions is, um, I see students more socially conscious about what they're doing and the impact they're having as opposed to how much does this pay or what are the benefits or those sorts of things. So one of the things that we have to be really good at marketing in forestry and other natural resources is we're we're taking care of a legacy that's been handed to us and we in turn will hand it to others um i think that's a that's a big piece of how we talk about this and forestry in general um isn't just putting trees into markets um 
I mean, we can talk about, you know, revenue going to, you know, offset property taxes and things like that. But the other part is we are the manager. This Where we end is where wildlife managers pick up their game. We create the habitat that they manage wildlife around. We create the, the watersheds that affects water quality and fisheries. Um, and, and so it isn't just forestry, it's all integrated. Um, but I, I, I think hopefully to answer your question, it's, we see just more of a, uh, what, what am I doing? How am I making a difference as opposed to how much am I getting paid? Am I, am I on track? Those you interns there, am I, am I char characterizing you fairly well or not? Yes, I'd, I'd say so. Um, I, I. I definitely, I, I see like definitely the truth to pretty much everything you've said um, in regards to people kind of um, recovering or not quite recovering from being just like kind of severed from all of their friends and relationships all at once um, during COVID, especially during a time whenever like those relationships are really fundamental to like figuring out how to be a person in the world. Um, I think that had a big toll on like a lot of people my age, but um, hopefully we'll make it out of it. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> um, but certainly in regards to people caring a lot more about um, what they're doing versus how much they're making, I think a lot of jobs pay around the same amount right now. And a lot of jobs, you know, um, I mean, people are in a lot of student debt coming out of college who are in our age group. And so I think people have just kind of accepted that um, they're probably going to be having financial burden for a long time and they might as well be doing something they like <laughs> and that matters to them. Um, but I also just wanted to say, I really liked your model that you were talking about with your structuring in your classes. Um, I think that a lot of the things you were talking about were things that I know have worked well for me and have worked well for other people who are in my um, kind of same like pathway of education in regards to the flipped classrooms and what you mentioned about being able to pause and go back um and kind of you know layering things on top of each other and really building and showing people where their skills are going to apply um I really really liked all the things you were talking about and I thought that um I hope that your students appreciate all the work you're putting into making sure that the model works well for them because I think you're doing an awesome job so thank, thank you. you for that thanks I just wanted to second everything that Sarah had said and I also really agree with the style of structure that you've chosen for this program because I think the fastest rate that I've ever learned things in college has been in like a study away semester when we did that exact model of going out into the field and doing applied taxonomy and multidisciplinary work in the areas that we were talking about managing, studying, conserving. Yeah, I should I should add to um, kind of following a couple of those comments. Um, so one of the things that uh, Bill Faber and I, the other instructor, we always tell students and parents that, hey, we're going to be your surrogate, surrogate parents for the next two years. You don't show up at class for a couple of days. We're going to be calling or emailing or finding out where you are. We 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 want to make sure your money is well invested. Um, we try and eliminate textbooks or any extraneous costs. You know, that student debt is a huge, huge issue. And we try and keep that as low as possible. We can't control, I can't control tuition, but I can control which tax. And I get away from them. I do a lot of um, a lot of things that don't require that. The other thing that I think <clears throat> is really important is when we start taking these students out, you know, I have 20 kids who've never met each other. I shouldn't say kids, students, because they're all across the board. Um, we throw them in a bus and you can hear a pin drop for the first trip out, maybe the trip back or something, um, and getting them out in the field, immediately we're putting them into groups and they have to rely on each other. And I keep notebooks and I constantly change the groupings around. In fact, if a student comes up and says, don't put me with this kid, I can't like them, guess who we'll, we'll talk about? Um, we'll talk about if you're having trouble with that and how to, how to deal with it. But Part of that is is having students to build networks, to build friends, because if they enjoy what they're doing and if they like who they're doing it with, they're going to keep coming back and and they're going to learn. And and that's part of it too is that social fabric that we really focus on. Yeah, I, 
Thank you, Ken, because that's that's where my mind went to as well, looking at that one year forestry certificate is, um, you know, you mentioned like the four credits around composition and really where my mind went was what are the other communication skills? Because I, I interpreted, and I could be wrong, I interpreted composition as really written skills. And so I was thinking, you know, is there a way to weave in um, training around conflict management, you know, or interpersonal skills, communication skills, even like contract management, those types of things that people might run into within this career. Um, because I think those skill sets, especially, you know, strategies and conflict management can be a really negative way of putting it. You know, really it's, it's effective communication when people are coming at, you know, and that, that happens with foresters or natural resource managers when it comes to like working with landowners, working with contractors, even working with colleagues, you have to have ways of listening as well as trying to be heard. Um, and, and those skill sets can really, um, you know, just boost confidence in, in terms of going into those situations and knowing you have the tool set to navigate it. So within your curriculum, you know, is there space for some, some of that skill development or on the interpersonal skills? We, we could certainly swap out some things. And we'd like to think that the composition and the um, introduction to public speaking is another one we do or interpersonal communication. We like to think we incorporate those into our classes. Those are some of our our um, learning objectives as well. So, for instance, in the intro to NR, which wasn't included on there, every week um, I've got a different excerpt from some some writer. It might be um, Ed, albeit it might be uh, Barry Lopez, it might be Sig Olson, or um, any of these that it reads. It goes along with the content, and they have to write a reflective paper, and they get some. You know, here's how you form a paragraph. Here's some, you know, this feedback to help them write more effectively. But to your point, um, working and having conversations, um, you know, we've all been there where someone has a pest problem or someone wants to write a plan for the forest or whatever. And what they ask is not really what they need. And they haven't really, you know, part of the maybe not conflict resolution, but part of that discussion is digging deeper to find out, oh, it, you know, yeah, you did have beetles in the tree, but, you know, it got flooded. So maybe the problem was with the flooding, the beetles were there cleaning up afterwards, or to really find out what their objective is for their force that they're trying to manage. And with having a good, effective converse, conversation, you get at a much better point than you do just, okay, here's what you want, I'll give you what you want. And you know, we certainly can can swap out, um, you know, that. Again, we're not going to, unfortunately, we can't get everything on that list, but it's what's most important for those those folks going and doing those entry-level positions. And and that's your forte, and we will take our lead. If it if it's more, we need to work on, on um, something with um, interpersonal communications, we're glad to swap that out with, with composition or whatever else. Yeah, because the last thing I'll say, and then I want a few more questions from the team, and then we'll we'll wrap up. But I appreciate your time, Kent. Is a uh, you know part of me anticipates things like plan writing being done by AI in the future. You know what I mean? And so I do think it's those the verbal skills, the you know the the listening and and those types of communication skills, like you said, public speaking that are going to be harder to to replace um, with technology. But you know, I don't know if that's an optimistic or a pessimistic view, but. Anyway, I'm just, I'll throw it out there. So with that, any other questions, comments from the team, please? And thanks, good to see you were able to come back, Ed, but other things from the team. Hey, Kent, um, I loved your presentation. I thought it was awesome. I learned so much about, you know, just, I don't know. I just really enjoyed the model. And it's almost one of those where I was like, yeah, I wish I could have gone through something like that. I could. Um, I'm just curious where I love the personal touches your program has where you're able to communicate with the students, like let's say because they're missing class or something's happening, or you know, they're having issues with another student, you're able to have those like personal touches. I'm curious where that number caps. Like, would it do you, could you foresee it capping at like 30, you know, a class full of 30 or 50, or you know, I'm just kind of curious about that. So we we can we would have to cap a section. At 24 and the or yeah 24. Um, the reason for that is that's our bus capacity. Quite honestly, we don't want a bunch of we don't want a parade or a train going out to every site. We want to get the students on the bus. 
um, for those reasons to, to talk to rather than being isolated in cars. And there's other reasons, obviously, safety and everything else. But we can do multiple sections um, at, you know, it becomes kind of a, we might have to bring in adjuncts to help teach or something. But typically our, our number caps at 24. It's as much, I think there's also um, a sweet spot in education with too many or too few. You think, boy, if I'm a class of three or four, I get all this attention, but there's something missing with, with the integration and ideas coming up and bubbling up from other students, the ability to mix groups and all of that. Um, so I guess to answer, it would be 24, but we could also do additional sections in that. Um, I should also mention that with our system, anyone who has a high school diploma is eligible for enrollment into a career in technical college in Minnesota. They don't have to have a certain cut score. They don't have to have an ACT or an SAT score or anything. Um, a high school diploma gets them in the door. So we're dealing with a pretty wide range of, of learners and bringing those together is, is somewhat challenging, but it, it's also really rewarding to do that too. I say I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I worked for eight years at a community college here in Virginia. Um, primarily doing technology transfer to local businesses, but I worked with the engineering technology uh, department there in developing curriculum. So I really appreciate the work that you've done to develop yours and want to say how impressed I am at the, the hands-on learning you have packed into such a short um, period of time to get people out in the field uh doing jobs and, and getting paid uh you've just done an outstanding job and i wanted to congratulate you on that yeah thank you harry i appreciate that if um if anyone's interested in taking a a, a look at obviously it's a little in arrears right now with me being on uh, sabbatical but we do have an instagram page um it's central lakes college natural resources I try and document all the different um, activities our students are in. So it goes back a couple of years. And I think before that, we had a Twitter page too, um, before it was X. Um, so that's out there if you want to take a little deeper dive into what we've been doing on some of those projects. Excellent. Awesome. Good. Well, thank you again, Ken, for your time. It, it, wonderful. And um, and if there, I would just say, you know, speaking for myself, but I'm guessing other team members feel the same way. If there's any way that we can support, you know, if there's questions coming up, I think this was a great opportunity for you to hear directly from some of our team members, their reactions to what you're proposing. And I hope that was gave you, I mean, I'm sure you have other sounding boards and ways to get feedback, but hopefully that was valuable. But if we, but if we can promote what you're doing, you know, I'd say Send me anything you want as you're announcing programs, all of those things, and just let us know how it's developing because I know the work that you're doing, many other educational academic organizations around the country are looking at you know, these innovative ways of engaging and retaining students, making sure people are prepared to succeed in their careers. I mean, all of these things you're working on are, are very shared. And so another model of how to do it, I, you know, there's, there's an audience for that, so. Appreciate it. But any final words, anything else you'd like to leave us with, Kent? Um, please, uh, I'll, I will do that. Um, as this begins to um, solidify and as we go through this process, I'll, I'll try and give you updates. And if anyone would love, I, I welcome your input as well as anyone else I've been reaching to. This is only going to be as good as the input I get. I can't sit here and come up with what works well. Um, it's all your combined experience um, in the different aspects of forestry or forest management. Um, and that helps me understand what we need to do to train and produce workers in that industry. I understand them coming in, but I need to know where to get them. I need a roadmap. Um, otherwise, I can take them anywhere, but I want to take them to where you need them. So please, good, bad, and different, send, send it to me. And I'll be happy to consider it. It's it's not, I'm going to ignore it and go on my way. I really, really can, can benefit from that. So I'd appreciate that. 